Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Gregorian, and I am with Glendale Library Arts and Culture. On behalf of all public libraries in Los Angeles, Ventura County, and beyond, I would like to thank you for joining the Southern California Library Cooperative and Glendale Library Arts and Culture for this event, which is part of Be the Change series, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism. Be the Change event's mission is to build a collective understanding of systematic racism to elevate the voices and stories of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and to inspire our communities to be the change. The series is generously supported by the City of Glendale Arts and Culture Commission and Outlook newspapers. You will find more Be The Change events and information at glac.info slash be the change. This evening, in honor of Armenian Genocide Remembrance Month, we are pleased to present Armenia Artsakh Diaspora, Memory, Identity and Responsibility with Salbi Hazarian and Eric Hakopian. Political consultant and commentator Eric Hakopian is a 30-year veteran of American politics, having worked on campaigns from the local to the presidential level. For the past 22 years, he has been the principal of ED Edge and Associates, a Southern California-based democratic consulting firm. He has been living in Armenia since 2017. Eric Hagopian is the host of Insight with Eric Hagopian, a new video series on CivilNet analyzing the political development of Armenia. Salbi Ghazarian is the director of Armenian Studies at USC. She joined the USC Institute of Armenian Studies in 2014 to lead a global intellectual center that brings together the skills, training, and passion of scholars, practitioners, leaders to address and resolve national and global challenges impacting communities in California, the United States of America, and the Republic of Armenia. And now I will turn the virtual mic to Salbi and Eric. Thank you. Hey, Eric Hagopian, welcome. Good to be on. Um, Eric, can I say a couple of thank yous on your behalf too? Absolutely. I wanna thank Elizabeth Gregorian, of course, for introducing us for all of the work she does. And a special, special thanks to Dr. Gary Schaefer, to Nicole Passini and to Tiffany Barrios. They not just invited us, but also walked us through this process. And as a lapsed librarian, I just wanna say we're really pleased to be part of a Southern California cooperative program, library program, hosted of course by Glendale Library Arts and Culture. And given how Eric, you and I have lived our lives, our professional lives and our personal lives, I think it's fair to say that being part of a series called Be the Change uh, that promotes inclusion, diversity, equity, anti-racism, well, it doesn't get better. Um, I also want to thank you, the listeners, the viewers for joining us. This is Genocide Remembrance Month and in just about 40 minutes, Eric Kagopian, who is in Yerevan, and I, who are in, is here, who am here in Highland Park, we're going to talk to you about memory, identity, responsibility, and the context of genocide and war for Armenia and diaspora and Artsakh or Gharapakh. I've got to say that it's really very gratifying that the planners had made sure to integrate Genocide Remembrance Month into a series that promotes inclusion, diversity, equity, anti-racism. Because genocide is nothing if not the exact opposite of those values. It's maximal exclusion to the point of murder. It's being afraid of diversity and forcibly criminally creating a monolithic society. It's the conclusion of years, decades of inequity and it is at its base racist. 
since genocide is the attempt by a government to rid itself of a very specific ethnic population. Eric, you agree on the appropriateness of the packaging? Absolutely. So in this context, let's talk genocide and memory and identity and responsibility. Of course, given that this conversation is taking place now, six months after one of the most devastating military assaults in recent history, and I don't just mean Armenian history, but world history, where the, especially contemporary world history, where the asymmetrical force utilized by a government against people it considers its own citizens, well, our conversation is really going to be a little bit different, clearly. And Eric, I think if you say a couple of sentences about the 2020 war over Ghadapal, then I'll lay out just a few basic facts about genocide in 1915, which began in April, which is why this is Genocide Remembrance Month now. Then we can move on to memory, both of those events and how they've shaped identity. But first, you about the war, please. This recent. Okay, what specifically do you want to recover about the war? Is it I the... think that there are viewers, listeners who don't know what this 2020 war was. Uh -huh. So, what was it? Why is it so impactful? And all of that in three sentences. Well, uh, what the area, the region is called Nagorno-Karabakh generally, and it's called Artsakh for Armenians. And it was a, one of the one of the endless enclaves created in the Soviet Union as was perceived to be as part of a general divide and rule type strategy in which they took a population that was predominantly Armenian and they put it inside of another uh, jurisdiction or another Soviet Republic. And at the end of the, uh, the Soviet Union, the area that was called Karabakh, which is predominantly Armenian, used the systems that were available inside of the Soviet Union to secede and become independent. And the response to that, the Azeri government of the time uh, tried to essentially ethnically cleanse Armenians out of that region. It failed and lost the war. Uh, 25, 30 years later, joined by a much larger, more powerful uh, army, which is Turkey in this case, uh, they did the same and for the most part uh, succeeded, uh, probably beyond their expectations of uh, taking back significant parts of what is considered Tharabakh, ethnically cleansing Armenians out of those regions, uh, and uh, came very close to uh, achieving what they wanted, which is to take an entire hostile population and either kill them or drive them out of their territory. And this was done in Europe, and no one essentially said anything or did anything to stop it. And uh, there's a this absurd parallel to this that one of the places that was ethnically cleansed of Armenians uh, was ethnically cleansed of Armenians literally 102 years ago by the same forces, which was the Turkish army. And that the Azeri offensive against Armenia and Artsakh was organized and run by actually a US ally, Turkey, a NATO member, uh, who actually ran the war. So there's that, that's the historical analogy, but the, the sort of the more relevant analogy is you, you also had two democratic states, Artsakh and Armenia, that were attacked by two, what can be comfortably described as neo-fascist states with neo-fascist ideas, very much like what happened in Spain in 1936, the world did nothing. And uh, we sort of had similar results. This, the world is, did nothing line is something we're gonna keep coming back to because I think the world continues to have this expectation, not just Armenians, but the world that something can and should be done. And yet the world order somehow doesn't make that likely and we haven't learned that. Um, let me just say something about the genocide because I think that people often um, don't understand the depth of the planning and the strategizing that led to it. This is not an event. First of all, it happened 105 years ago. It happened in the Ottoman Empire and it happened during World War I. And this was not a case of a whole lot of people dying in war. Genocide is the organized killing of a people for the express purpose of ending their collective existence. This is a planned, strategically implemented operation. It requires central planning. It requires machinery and this is what took place between 1915 and 1918. Out of a population of two million Armenians, a million and a half were killed. And they were killed um, by all sorts of means, deportation, long walks in the desert, 
uh, rape, pillaging, stealing of property and wealth. At the end of the day, a million and a half died and all of those areas that were historically Armenian lived were empty of their Armenian population. Why does this matter? Because it is uh, an act by a government whose sole purpose really is to protect its citizens. What's a government for? And when this kind of crime goes unrecognized, although it's got to be said, the irony is that Republican Turkey, which came after Ottoman Turkey, Republican Turkey actually called to trial and found guilty dozens of the generals and governors who were responsible. But after Republican Turkey came into existence, the Europeans decided allies are better than enemies. That whole thing was not only just forgotten, but also denied. And as a result, the destruction of the Armenian communities in that part of the world was total. Uh, that as a result, Southern California has many, many Armenians, large at first, largely because they, we, are the descendants of the survivors of that genocide. And now, of course, the Southern California community also has a huge emigrate community from what was the Soviet Republic of Armenia, now the Republic of Armenia, where the first Arapah War 30 years ago opened up the, the gates of out-migration. And over these last 30 years, the community here has grown. So if, um, if Eric and I have done half a decent job of presenting the context for what we're gonna talk about, let's Eric go on and talk about identity, about especially as not just victims of genocide, but also the participants of nation building after the Soviet collapse. The descendants of both of those processes are today proud Americans, proud Canadians, proud French, living in liberal, inclusive, value-laden societies. They, we are connected to Armenia in different ways because that's where the cultural and ethnic roots go. And now there is this continuing feeling of insecurity because we're stuck between two countries with belligerent leaders, no restraint, and based on all of that, we have to build an identity. We have to say who we are and what we believe in. So help out, who are we and what do we believe in? Well, we're many things. Uh, and identity, frankly, put it in frank terms, is just stories you tell about yourself. It's really not, nothing beyond that. Those are just pretty academic words. And as people that are so dispersed in the world, you have a million stories. You know, the, there's the Argentine Armenian story, there's the French one, there's the Iranian one, there's the every corner of the world one. So, uh, and I think the key here, and I think the lesson for, I mean, what's useful to the world is how we marry the two. Because uh, having dual, sometimes triple identities is very normal, considering that most Armenians live around the world. And you can be a proud American and you can be a proud Armenian. There's no contradiction in that. Uh, you can, you know, Armenians wear the uniform of every country that they serve and that they live in, sometimes in contradiction to each other. Uh, so this, the story is we're sort of leapfrog other people in having to deal with these identity issues and uh, integration issues of how do you make this how do you keep two separate notions of yourself going, which is a quite a modern concept, frankly, in the West, because it's, it's even a modern concept in the United States up until the 60s and 70s, the entire push was about, you know, from many come one, which is the motto of the United States, but the many has become, it has a different meaning now, even in the United States. That's where so, this whole discussion about diversity so, and inclusion comes in, right? That it's okay. It is, so I think this is, uh, and you know, actually a great deal, the Armenian identity actually owes a great deal to the struggles of African-Americans and other people in the 60s that actually opened up the road for people to have self-identity and not be forced into a certain notion of Americanness. So I think uh, what we have to offer is how do, you, how do you navigate the two? And to show the world that frankly, there is no contradiction. Uh, it actually makes you a richer person. It makes the cultures around you richer. 
because you can bridge multiple cultures and multiple traditions, uh, some of them entirely contradictory. And you know, you can see it in the streets in Armenia from the from my house generally to my kids' school. If you walk there, you're bound to listen to six or seven different languages. And for the most part, no one uh, perceives that as a negative here. Uh, I mean, Armenians can be as closed-minded as anybody else, frankly. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I mean, it's not, no one's gonna complain, oh, why are these people here? So it's, it's, so it's sort of like this uh, wonderful melting pot, but in a different kind of way, not an American kind of way, but it's, it's more of a salad bowl rather than a melting pot. You know, I wanna, I want to connect this idea of being comfortable being all of the various things that one is. I want to connect it to the concept of responsibility because I think that um, especially those of us who grew up with survivors, that survivors of the genocide, that we understand what the impact of continuing trauma is we viscerally live, understand the lived experience of people who have been assaulted, orphaned, um, undergone all sorts of physical and psychological violence, and then continue to raise children and families and grandchildren. And we, it is easy to fall into the false assumption that this is special, that it's different, well, it's certainly special to me, but that it's different in some ways. And, you know, I had one of our students at the Institute do a Google search um, on genocide in the news. Huh? This isn't historic search. This is just using the term genocide in the news right now. Um, she came up with a list of eight. And I think that, you know, there's probably a few more. Yemen, Nigeria, Kashmir, the Yazidis, uh, South Sudan, the Rohingya in Myanmar, the Uyghurs in China, this is now, it's today. Mm -hmm. So with our mixed identity, what's our responsibility? Well, I mean, our responsibility is, is to uh, two things on, the, on our side, on, on, the, on, the, on, our, on the side of our culture is to understand that, that what happened to us was uh, not unique in some ways. It's, every genocide is unique in its own way, but the world is full of, what I call the crucified people of history. <laughs> We're simply another one of the crucified people of history. And each one of the crucified people of history think of themselves as singularly crucified. And when, you, when you're honest about it, you find out that you're not singularly crucified. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a, you know, the world has a pecking order and uh, certain lives matter more than others. So if you want to change anything, you want to make sure that certain lives don't matter more than others. So there's a singular standard. So that's our responsibility uh, to tell that story. But I'm not particularly optimistic about the world caring or wanting to listen to that story. So now this is the second or third time you have said, we have said about the world and indifference. And um, just the other day in the LA Times, there was an article about Myanmar. And the headline was, Myanmar's bloodshed reveals a world that has changed and hasn't. And the two lines that stuck out were, there is one way in which the world has not much changed. It's seeming inability to stop government-sponsored killings once they begin. Mm -hmm. And the other line was, once a military kills its own with impunity and even feels it benefited from the bloodshed, there's very little to stop it from doing so again. Well, I think uh, there's a level of we got to be careful because what, what's happening in Myanmar internally is it's not really genocide. Uh, what they did to the Rohingya is genocide. Genocide. Don't that's what this refers to. Once they did yeah, it, so I, think, I think I think we need. To, yeah, there's there's a slippery slope that goes there very quickly. But you know, we you know we want to be careful in how we uh, categorize some of these. Uh, Absolutely, things. but at the end of the day, the point is. Stopping government-sponsored killings, assaults, war. On the one hand, peoples have this expectation. Armenians have spent decades documenting New York Times and the London Times articles about the New York about the genocide in real time. And well, yet, I think, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, and that we turn around and we say, but the world didn't do anything. Well, I mean, listen, I think the uh, last uh, six months uh, living here, and I, well, lived here for a couple of years, but the post-war period, uh, what it confirmed with me is that uh, the reasons the genocides happen is because they work. It's a very practical reason for it. Mm -hmm. Solves lots One, of if they work. Two, that there's no punishment for it, with very rare exceptions. Uh, I mean, people think the Holocaust failed. It really didn't fail. There's hardly any Jews in Europe. There's no, there's no, outside of Russia, there's not a single country in Europe that has significant numbers of Jews, or compared to what they used to. The Armenian genocide worked to the extent that the object was to ethnically cleanse Turkey, the parts that Armenians lived, had lived for thousands of years. It worked pretty much without any consequences. So we need to, uh, you know, last six months, I've lost my rose colored human rights type of uh, sort of, you know, the US leftist type of view of what the world is. And that's not, that's not the world. The world, uh, these things happen. They, they happen for a reason because all lives are not equal and that genocides work. When genocides stopped working, that's when, you know, when people say never again, that never again will only happen if the price for committing a genocide is higher than what you gain from it. There's still, you know, the Azeri regime essentially ethnically cleansed significant numbers of Armenians out of land that they've lived for millennia. And there are still plenty of people in London, New York, and other places people with Cambridge and Harvard degrees that are willing to make $1,500 an hour to say all kinds of uh, lies uh, and cover up all kinds of crimes uh, so they can go on and live their comfortable lives and make their comfortable, you know, seven-figure incomes. That's the reality. It's not a pleasant reality, but genocides work. Ethnic cleansing works. And they will continue until they stop working. So I don't know if the continuation of that thought lies in this next question. It kind of does for me, but let me ask you. Um, you know, in the Jewish community over the last half decade, decade, there's been a serious concern that now with the survivors gone, how do you continue to keep the memory of the violence, the memory of the immensity of this event alive and relevant. How would you answer that question? I mean, the Armenian case, we've been living with this for you know half a century longer than the Jewish case, but how do you answer that question? How does- Well, they're gonna, they're gonna fail. <laughs> and yeah, that's how you answer the question. You can't do it. The world rolls on, other things come and take its place, other horrors take its place. And uh, it's easier for the uh, people who want to cast doubt on basic historical facts, and especially now and with this crazy world of unfiltered social media, it's even easier to start things. Uh, I think I, I actually today I read a poll in which uh, said that in, in the US 10% of people actually blamed the Holocaust on Jews. So uh, bottom line is, uh, yeah, I understand their concern, but they're gonna fail just like every other attempt at it fails because that's just not how the world works. All right, let me disagree with you in the following way. Um, one of the ways that I have found that I most fundamentally understand the, I can't even find the adjectives, the very real personal violence that was committed against one and a half million individual human beings, Armenians. One of the ways that I can deal with that best is by reading about Rwanda, which only happened 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, and as a result of, again, my memories and my grandmother, my response to that question about how do you keep this relevant is to say that you find a corner of the world that you want to fix. You can't fix the pain that was go that's gone, their pain. 
but we can each find a corner of the world that we want to fix in order to prevent some aspect of that pain being uh, transmitted to somebody else in some corner of the world. Now, is that rose-colored glasses? No, 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 no. There's absolutely no contradiction with that on what I was saying. I was, I was speaking in very practical terms, as far as how historical events are dealt with, even horrific historical events are dealt with, and the sort of the pitfalls of our current media environment. No, of course. I mean, listen, it's, but that's like anything, you know, you try to heal your corner of the world and everybody tries to hold up their piece of the sky. So I, I, there's absolutely no contradiction in that. And I think your approach is the only one. Frankly, it's the only useful, it's the only useful thing that anyone can dedicate their life to. So there's no contradiction in that. Good. That's good when I, when Eric and I agree, this is good. Um, Eric, the concept, let's keep going with this concept of responsibility because although we are speaking about the Armenian, the Armenian case, the Armenian responsibility, the Armenian need, responsibility of Armenians and to Armenians, just as to any victims. There's also the need to understand that the world functions with its own rules, right? Mm -hmm. The concept of sovereignty, mm -hmm means that an international agency, an international entity, a country, cannot walk into another country and say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. I mean, uh, it's not a huge uh, in, in, uh, not in a, not in every case. It's, it's that, that, that holds until uh, the people that are doing the criminal acts are not, they're not one of the popular kids in the school. If you're one of the popular kids in the school, you can get away with anything. So I, I think that that you know we've seen this in uh, you know the, what I'm mean, to give you a perfect example. Like take Kosovo, what the Azeri and the Turkish leaders have said about Armenians are far more vicious than anything Slobodan Milosevic ever said about the Kosovars ever. Now he did pretty horrible things there, but if you just look at the language. There's not even there's not even a closed case. There's not even a case there. So it, it, it depends on the world operates on acceptable victims, unacceptable victims, uh, acceptable criminals, and unacceptable criminals. So it's a, you have to navigate the hypocrisy of the world to get to the answer that you want. If we were having this conversation a year ago, we would have been talking, I think, about how the 100th centenary um, showed that remembrance and the way we remember isn't unified anymore, it's fragmented. Mm -hmm. There's a pluralism to the way that we commemorate. And so there's a growing pluralism as to what to commemorate. And I think that feeds into what you just said, that is, how do you commemorate? What do you remember? How do you share it? So that the point about never again and not transmitting this kind of violence as a method of governance, which is what Turkey continues to do, right? If it worked with the Armenian minority, it can work with Kurds. And in the last two, three, four, five years, it works really well with you know, the Turkish uh, civil society and journalists and others. So, so how do you turn that pluralism of what it is we're remembering to how we also share that in ways that are impactful? Listen, as you just going back to your previous point, uh, anything that leads to action is useful. Anything that doesn't lead to action is not useful. Uh, I frankly don't care much about remembrance things because they're empty, uh, meaningless uh, events for the most part for political figures to come and say three words for their own political purposes. You act, it's how you build. I mean, listen, the key thing to me as an Armenian 
and we're in Easter. You know, uh, what matters in Easter is not the crucifixion, it's the resurrection that matters. Uh, that's the story of Easter, and that's, the, that's our story. Uh, there's nothing unique. Uh, there's unique things about what happened to us, but horrific things have happened before. They're happening now. They've happened in recent past, and they'll happen in the future. And the issue is how you come back from it. And what I look at is the, res the work that you do in building things in your community, for example, or in the world, or in unity with other people, or in, let's say, for example, in our community, is the resurrection that is the victory. And that despite the most horrific intent uh, and the, the horrible defeats that we have suffered and all the tragedies that we know, one, we're around, two, we're very creative in the way we approach things. Three, and this is as this is just geopolitically, you know, we are the freest country in this region. Uh, despite the fact that you know we've been attacked, we've been we've suffered genocide, and the people who the people who killed us, and the people who oppressed us, and the people who attacked us. Uh, you're not. I don't. You don't like this phrase. They live like slaves. Well, we're free. So who, you know, who wins at the end? What so, do you think we're the freest country in the region? Politically, yeah, I, I can, you know, I can sit in Armenia and I can call out all kinds of people in power and no one's gonna knock on my door to take me away. That's not true of it in, in most of our neighbors. Uh, and some of them, hell, you'll be carted off before uh, the show's done. So uh, we have this, this besieged people that have been attacked and vilified, lied about, murdered. Their descendants uh, live as free people, while the people who oppress us don't. Um, say your South Korea line too, before I ask you the next question. Well, I mean, it's just it's a simple one. You, you know, just get a map, get a world map, draw a direct line from Armenia to South Korea, and you will not find a single country uh, that has uh, the freedoms we enjoy here. And that's literally half the world. You'll go through all of Central Asia, you'll go through China, you'll go through Russia, and, and you will get, you'll go through North Korea, and literally you go through half the world, and there's not another country that enjoys the political or personal freedoms we enjoy here. And that's quite a remarkable accomplishment for this besieged and suffering country and people. Okay, instead of besieged and suffering, how about resilient? Um... There is a, an article called Trauma Stories as Resilience, and it is about Armenian and Irish national identities. Uh, the, and the, the line that, that stuck with me is, the collective memory of the conflict is at once an expression of resilience in the wake of trauma. Just the fact that we're remembering is an act of resilience. And it's a vehicle for reinforcing the divisions at the heart of the conflict itself. Yeah. So on the one hand, it keeps us going, mm -hmm. victims, and on the other hand, it gives you agency to say that by remembering, I'm going to make a difference, do something. Well, first of all, I love the Irish and I love that comparison. Yeah, and we have a lot more things in common, and some of them are in PC to say, but we have a lot of things in common. Uh, but I think the uh, part of that is actually the concept of negative identity, where you define yourself by your enemies. And people who have suffered, people who have been oppressed, always define themselves by their enemies, uh, because in some ways they have no choice to. So. Uh, what we're not uh, is as relevant as who we are. And that's true of any people that have been oppressed or wronged or however you want to describe it. So you, you sort of, you're touching on the concept of negative identity without spelling it out, but that's what it really is. Um, I'm gonna ask you a silly question before I ask you my last question. So my silly question is before we started, I put my laptop on top of a couple of books 
so that I wouldn't be looking down like this and make it hard for the viewers. And I asked you to do the same thing. Now, don't laugh. What books did you use? Uh, D Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov is a fat book. <laughs> and then Deng, Deng Xiaoping's biography. Okay. Uh, so I'll tell you what I have. I have Romeo Dallaire's uh, autobiography, Shake Hands with the Devil, Rwanda. And I have Ron Suni's book uh, about Stalin. Um, and the reason, I just think it's fun. I, I ask people, you know, what, what is that book that's there? But one of the reasons I'm asking, and this really is my last question, is that in this conversation about um, memory and identity, I think what we choose to remember, any victim of assault and trauma, what is remembered is what drives the rest. And I think that 100 years and all of the historic and political challenges that Armenians have faced over these 100 years, you know, the genocide and then really you know, difficult years of a first republic, Sovietization, sometimes uh, satisfying, sometimes Stalin and the very difficult purge years, uh, collapse of Soviet Union, miserable economy, uh, constant at war, at peace, not at peace with neighbors. All of that I think has led us to forget or not learn some of the fundamentals about what was lost. Mm -hmm. What was lost was not just a bunch of village homes. What was lost was a whole civilization mm -hmm. that was fundamentally integrated into the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. That need to know more, to share better, I think is on everybody, libraries, librarians, teachers, the rest of us who preach, how do we make that accessible? The fact that, you know, the musicologists of the Ottoman Empire were the Armenians. Govidas Vartabit also did the documentation for Ottoman music. The alphabet later of the Turkish Empire was an Armenian. This is an integrated society. This isn't a bunch of othered people. So. Mm -hmm. Those who were subject to genocide were an integral part of an empire. That is possible, people. That is something to be afraid of. Well, I think, listen, I think there's a, this is where morality and, you know, modern conceptions of uh, a being or ethnicity meet, uh, uh, listen, meet cold heart, uh, facts of where countries are at today. Uh, Turkey is in some ways the sort of the, the dream country for every uh, nationalist extremist group in the world. Uh, a country that read itself of any ethnic minorities, whether they were Greeks or Armenians or Jews or Assyrians or whoever, that have essentially all been run out of the country one way or the other, except in minuscule numbers. And now they've gone to, they, so they go, they move on to other people, the Kurds and then the, their own dissidents. The end of the day, what you get, this sort of this dream scenario for, for extreme nationalists is a beautiful country that has a failed culture, a failed economy and a failed society that can't even understand or can't even mention the most basic things about its history. Uh, Turkey's per capita income is $8,000 a year. Imagine what Turkey would be if 30% of its populations were Jews, Greeks, and Armenians, fully integrated as a European country. By comparison, Greek's GDP is 20,000. Just take it in sheer economic scale. The places where Armenians were run out of are still miserably poor places because you destroyed the entire merchant class. So there's practical effects of this. That failed Turkish, this neo-fascist culture, this neo-fascist state, uh, and this failed economy is what you get for every nationalist around the world if you get your way. You want to know what you're going to look like? That's what you're going to look like. That's a fine place to end. Hopefully. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, 
hopefully this these opportunities to integrate into this kind of global conversation is helpful both to Armenians everywhere and to those who really have a hard time understanding what that sort of deep trauma can do to a country, uh, not just a people, but a country. Um, Eric Kagopian, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you all for watching and thank you to the Glendale Library Arts and Culture for this invitation. This was an eye-opening conversation. Thank you, Eric and Salbi, for sharing this illuminating conversation on the situation in Armenia. It is critical to raise awareness and understanding of challenges faced in Armenia and to continue this conversation. Thank you again. Please make sure you follow our next live presentation on Saturday, April 10th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Author and lecturer, Dr. Muradian, will be in conversation with filmmaker and screenwriter, Eric Nazarian, to discuss Muradian's new book, Resistance Network. To register, please visit www.glac.info slash be the change. The Glendale Library Arts and Culture has planned many virtual programs about Armenian culture, including cooking, art, and comedy, along with additional interviews. For more information on our programs, please visit www.eglendalelac.org slash Armenian. Glendale Library Arts and Culture and Reflect Space Gallery present Sites of Fracture, Diasporic Imaginings of Occupied Artsakh, a virtual exhibition that brings together diasporan Armenian artists from the United States, Canada, and Germany to create a collective counter narrative to forces of occupation and cultural erasure in the Republic of Artsakh. Sites of Fracture launches on April 19 in a 3D virtual gallery accessible through the Reflect Space Gallery website www reflectspace.org. Thank you for joining and a heartfelt thanks to Eric and Salvi. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and stay safe.